So what we're going to do is talk about the things which are, okay? Hopefully you have read Revelation through, and now you're going to go back and read it little chunks at a time. Uh, so you should have read Revelation 2 last week, and we're going to take it kind of, we're going to go at a real slow pace through the churches. Uh, I may speed up a little bit next week. We'll see how many churches I can get in. But I'm dedicating today just to the church of Ephesus and just to uh, the church of Laodicea in a few weeks. That'll be just, and then we'll, we'll figure out how the other stuff. So, all right, here we are. Session three, the things which are, and that comes from Revelation 119. Remember what the, the three divisions of the book of Revelation, what are they? The things which were, the things which, and the things which to come. Right. And Revelation chapter 1 is the things which were. Okay? Because it's a really, if you look at Revelation 1, yeah, all it is talking about is Jesus. It's a, you, you see so much descriptive terminology about Christ in Revelation 1. You want to know who Jesus is? Read Revelation 1. It'll, it'll let you know who he is. And he's, you know, a lot of times we have this idea of Christ, and it's an accurate idea that Christ is just this loving, you know, he, he's just gentle, and he is. But, there, you know, just like a, 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 a six-sided die, there's different facets to Christ, and that's just one facet. When you read that other stuff, flaming sword, a, a sword comes out of his mouth. I mean, that's not gentle and docile. Okay, he's the creator of the universe. So, today we're going to start for probably the next three or four weeks, the things which are. And I think you're going to be really blessed by this because, uh, as I've discussed in the past, Revelation 4 on is stuff I believe, and I'm subject to being wrong, okay, uh, stuff that I believe takes place after the rapture of the church. So this is stuff, as Chuck Mesler says, this is stuff we watch from the mezzanine. Okay, we watch it from the balcony. Okay, all these things that go on. It doesn't mean there's not messages for us there, though. Okay, because one of the things that studying Revelation really helps us do, helps us learn the Old Testament. Because that's the context by which John wrote the book of Revelation. As I mentioned, 800 different allusions. Some exact quotes. So, the things which are. So, that's this week's scripture. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. And we read later that Jesus is saying, hey, I'm the first and the last. I'm the one who was alive, was dead, and now I'm alive again. That's the deity of Christ. Anybody remember what kind of structure Revelation is written in? has to do with the number seven. Heptatic. The heptatic structure of the book of Revelation. Because literally there are hundreds of sevens in the book of Revelation. Seven, where it says first through one through seven, you may have seven beatitudes or seven blessings or seven this or seven that. Uh, seven churches, seven lampsteads, seven, seven candlesticks. Okay? They're the seven descriptions of Christ. And what you're going to find out, too, is we're going to get into the letters. There's sevenfold instruction in the letter. Okay, so it's written in a heptatic structure. And remember, there's four views of prophecy. Uh, and I should say prophetic interpretation. We have preterism, historicism, idealism, and finally futurism. Anybody remember what preterism is? Preterists. We call them preterists. Those are the people who believe that John actually wrote the book of Revelation before 70 AD, which as we showed from the, the historian Asubius, that that was never the understanding back in the first couple of centuries of the church. The understanding was, uh, and Asubius wrote this, that John wrote it on the Isle of Patmos in 95 AD. He was exiled by, by the emperor Domitian. And so therefore, the preterist view can't be possible because the preterist view substantiates the fact that the fact quote unquote that all of the book of revelation took place before or during 
70 AD, 71 AD, the fall of Jerusalem. And we know that the book of Revelation wasn't written until almost 25 years later. And so how could that be? All right. Historicism, that's that view that says, hey, this is all historical. It happened over the, it, this, this, it unfolds and it's symbolic and it unfolds over the history of the church. And finally, idealism is the same thing. It's all symbolic. There is no literal beast. There is no, you know, uh, mark of the beast. There is no rebuilding of the temple. It's all symbolic. Uh, which, you know, I always say, what's the fun in that? You know, uh, first of all, if you look through the scriptures, God does use a lot of symbolism. But symbolism always points to something concrete. Okay. So we have futurism. So for this week, we're going to look at the fourfold interpretive theory. Sevenfold structure. Uh, once again, there's our sevenfold and the letter to the Church of Ephesus. So, first of all, the fourfold theory. What this means is that each one of these letters can be viewed in four different ways. Now, some of you are probably familiar with that a lot of the prophecies in the Bible have double fulfillments. Uh, a lot of prophecies in the Bible just point to one thing. You know, Psalm 23. Uh, points to one thing. Psalm 22, the Messianic Psalm, points to Jesus Christ, the cross. That's it. But there's other scriptures that have double fulfillments. Uh, I think of John chapter 14. Okay? When Jesus says, in my Father's house are many mansions. And I go there and prepare a place for you and so I can come and receive you again to myself. That's actually a double prophecy. A lot of people get stuck on the one part of the prophecy. They think, well, that just happens when the believer dies. And that is true. But ultimately, that's fulfilled when Jesus comes again. Okay, it's a double fulfilling prophecy. Well, we have a fourfold theory for interpreting these seven letters. First is that these are local churches. They're actually churches. There was an Ephesus. There was a church of Ephesus. And that's what we're going to look at today. There was a Smyrna. There was a Pergamos. There was a Thyatira. There was a Sardis. There was a Philadelphia. And there was a Laodicea. These are actual churches. Admonitory. Now, what this is, is this is meant for all the churches in some aspect. Each message, the, the letter of the church of Ephesus also applied to the letter of the church of the Laodiceans. And guess what? The letter to the church of Ephesus also applies to First Baptist Church of Sharon. Okay? There's aspects to each of these that will apply to us that we can use. Now, the real interesting thing is, is when we get into looking at these churches, you're going to see that some of these churches are going to remind you of places you've been. <coughs> okay? You may have been a member of a church of Philadelphia, and they might have been 100% Philadelphia. You may have been to a church of Sardis, and they were 100% Sardis. You may have been to a Laodicea church, and they were 100% Laodicea. What you're really going to find, though, is that you probably have been to, most of your churches have been 90% this, 10% that, maybe 50-50, maybe 40-20-20-20. There's a mixture, okay? So it's meant to admonish all churches. These letters are meant to admonish all churches throughout history, okay? So it's not only to the local church that was there. It's admonitory. Homiletic. If you remember reading in Revelation 2 and 3, you heard this seven times. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So this is to you and me. This is to us. He who has an ear, let him hear. This is Jesus saying, hey, I need you to listen. 2,000 years later, 1,900 years later, 1,925 years later. You, in Rochera, and I need you to listen what I am saying to this church because it applies to you. So there are the three most common. Well, this is the one I'm about to show you is relatively new, and it's because of the way prophecy has unfolded. We didn't really understand it till less than 100 years ago. And so if you look at any, like on your e-sword, if you look at Gill, if you look at Matthew Henry, if you look at... Uh, Fawcett and, and Brown, if you look at these commentaries, you won't see this. And the reason why is, remember what we talked about last week, Daniel chapter 12, verses 4 and verses 9. 
What is prophecy? It's sealed. And it's getting what? Open. So a lot of things that, that we see now that seem very clear, people were blinded to by the Holy Spirit. And we know from Romans 11 that the Holy Spirit does blind people. I mean, he has blinded the nation of Israel. Okay? There is a veil. They can't see. When I was going to Catholic Church, I always wondered what that problem was. There you go. It applies, to, it applies to you. Finally, is the prophetic. That each church represents a period of church history. So the church of Ephesus represents a period of church history. And the, the theory holds it like this because of their name, first of all. Each, like Ephesus, as we will find today, means desirable. Each church has a specific name. And so when you when you think about it, why did G I mean, there was more than seven churches, right? I mean, we already know that the Church of Jerusalem is not mentioned, the Church of Corinth is not mentioned, the Church of Antioch is not mentioned, the Church in Crete is not mentioned. So there's four right there, four very large churches that aren't mentioned. Why did God choose these seven? He could have did a blanket statement to all the churches, but he chose seven specific churches. Now, remember what we've talked about. Nothing is there by chance. Okay? So because of their name, because of the order, and we'll look at that, and their commendations and their condemnations, we have this theory that each church represents a church age. And I'll look at that briefly. And as we look at the churches individually, we will discuss that in a little bit more detail. And here's how this works. We go from Ephesus to Smyrna, from Smyrna to Pergamon, Pergamon to Thyatira, Thyatira to Sardis, Sardis to Philadelphia, Philadelphia to Laodicea. If you switch the order, just, just move Laodicea to Ephesus and put Ephesus at the end. This theory falls apart. The only way it works is if these are in the exact order. And notice how they're in this, in this line, this circle. It, it shows me that God is in charge of the church and he's going to do he's sovereign, totally sovereign okay because long before the book of Revelation was written, these churches were started and God knew what they were going to be, he knew the church of the Laodiceans were going to be a bunch of high and mighty haughty people but he still started a church there he served his purpose so now we're also going to look at sevenfold structure. So I'll breeze through these and then we'll focus on it in Ephesus. The name of the church. We're going to look at the name. Each church has a name. As I said, Ephesus means desirable. We're going to look at the title of Christ. In each one of these letters, Jesus calls himself something different. He lists a different attribute. So in Revelation 1, not only do we have seven attributes of who Jesus is, now we're going to have seven more in Revelation 2 and 3. Okay. We're going to look at their commendation. Well, five churches have a commendation. Two churches do not. Jesus has nothing good to say about them. Okay? The church of Sardis and the church of Laodicea. Jesus did not have one good thing to say about these churches. Condemnation. Okay? There are five churches that have uh, condemnations. And there's two churches who don't. Okay? The church of uh, Smyrna. <coughs> does not have a condemnation. And the Church of Philadelphia does not have a condemnation. Jesus only has good things to say about them. But he gave counsel to every one of them. He also gave a promise to the overcomer, the person who, who can overcome, the person who perseveres, the person who conquers, to the conqueror. He gave a promise. And then finally, the sevenfold structure is, in every one of them, it ties it together. He who has an ear, what the Spirit says to the churches. Okay, so that's the sevenfold structure, and you'll see this in every letter. We'll also look at some background in the city uh, in which these churches were. We'll look at their prophetic fulfillment and the application to us as believers. Okay, and there may be some miscellaneous information thrown in. As a matter of fact, in, in the book, uh, to the letter to Ephesus, there is some miscellaneous info. So there it is. There's what church history laid out looks like. And if you've done any study in church history, you know this is very accurate. Okay? We have the apostolic church for the first hundred years. Then we have a persecuted church for the next 200 years. 
Then we have the adults church. That's when the church started marrying the state in the early Roman Empire. And then we had the pagan church, which continues to this day. We have the dead church. Now, this is very interesting because notice the dead church fits into the period of 1520. Anybody remember what happened in 1520? Bingo. The Reformation, which we as Protestants always look at as a good thing. And you will see when we look at the Church of Sardis, it fits the Reformation. And you will see, and if you know church history, you will know that the Reformation was, there was some good in it, but it was mostly used as a tool. Okay, to get out under the thumb, the thumb of Rome because they were pagan. And finally, the Church of uh, Philadelphia, the church that Christ loved, started in about 1650 until the time of the rapture. And then the, finally, the Church of Laodicea, which actually started at the turn of the last century, uh, 1900. That's the lukewarm church. And if you trace church history, you can see that's where we really started to make this transition from being the Philadelphian type churches to the lukewarm churches. Mm -hmm. Okay? So Ephesus. Ephesus was founded in 1400 BC. All right, it's called the was called the Queen of Asia. And in the New Testament period, Ephesus was the largest city of its day. It's huge. So we're going to look at Ephesus as a huge city, and then we got little bitty cities, you know, like Thyatira and places that you know were really not that noteworthy. It was founded by Paul. Paul pastored there for a little while, and then it was uh, eventually pastored by Timothy when Paul moved on. So, the name. Well, we talked about this already. It means desirable or darling. So, this is what Jesus is basically saying during this period. This is desirable. You're darling. You're dear to me. Okay? And here's the title. That Christ uses on himself. He that holds the seven stars in his right hand. Who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. What were the lampstands again? Churches. Right. Okay. And why did we say that the lampstand. The, the idea of the lampstand is important. Because what's the lampstand do? Holds the light. Right. Does a lampstand produce light on its own? No. It can't produce light light apart from the candle that's in it okay and that light is the holy spirit functioning in us as believers um as a matter of fact can you open your bible to revelation 2 for me oh, oh, <laughs> so here is a here's an interesting thing and this is another topic for another day but jesus says you know if you do not do the things that I'm telling you to do. Do you remember what he says he'll do? Remove the, Remove the lampstand. In other words, Jesus says, if you do not listen to me, if you do not heed my warning here, I am going to take your church. You want to know why churches fold? Have you ever thought about it? Why, why do churches, I mean, we close, I don't know how many thousands of churches a year, the doors close. As Baptists. Why is that? Because they're not doing the first things. Okay? That's the simple reason. It's not that they're founded on a faulty business model. It's not that they're founded... Can I help you? You okay? Okay. It's not that they're founded on a faulty business model. It's not that their pastor's not great. It's because the church as a whole is not doing the first things. They have... Falling out of love with Christ. So the commendation. In verses 2 and 3 we see Christ says, hey, I really admire your good works. I really admire the fact that you've got, you are working hard. You've got patience. And guess what? You're real good at punishing sin. You don't tolerate evil. Now, this reminds me a lot of Southern Baptist churches. It really does. Um, We do a lot of good work. We support a lot of missionaries. We have we do work. Uh, patience uh, that can be debatable, uh, but you know, in the old days, especially I say the old days, oh, yeah. we didn't tolerate evil. We did not tolerate sin to the extent sometimes that we forgot the grace of God. 
okay? Uh, but here's the, con the, condemn the condemnation. You have forsaken your first love. And here's what he says. I have this against you. You have abandoned the love you had at first. What is the love we had at first? Just get more specific. No. No. What's the, the, who did we first love? When we, when we became Christians, Jesus. The church was founded on loving Christ. And so what Jesus is saying here is that when you don't love me first in your daily walk, in your life as a church, when I am not first priority, that means when this isn't your first priority. God's word. This is God's love letter to us. When this isn't our first priority, we have fallen. And we have one piece of advice he gives us. Repent. Turn around. Walk in another direction. Change your mind about this. You're wrong. And do the works you did at first. Notice he commands them for works. But then he says, go back to your first work. Okay? And your first work was loving God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and mm -hmm. strength. Okay? And then loving your neighbor as yourself. That's the first works. Okay? All of this other stuff we do as churches, you know, it, it, it fails the test of this. You know, I, I debated on whether or not to put this, speak to this, but I'm, but I'm going to. I was in a conference. How long, I don't remember how long ago that was, about four years ago uh, at Sagemont Church. And we, it was a big powwow meeting of all the state association. We had some Southern Baptist Convention Association uh, I mean, uh, directors there. It was about 50 people. And we were talking about the direction of the church. It was uh, kind of like a, a brain trust strategy session on where we're headed. And a lot of these older pastors were really complaining about the new pastors. They said, literally, we're leaving billions and billions of dollars to the world because these new pastors all want a new church rather than coming into the old church and, and working there and et cetera, et cetera. Well, I look at things a little differently than that. Okay? To me, this is God's kingdom. It's not man's kingdom. Mm -hmm. And finally, after about 30 minutes of this, I'd had enough. And I said said, you know, Revelation chapter 2, I said, it explains your predicament. You want to know why your churches are folding and why new pastors want to go put new wine into new wine skins and not try to shove old, new wine into old wine skins, which is what you want them to do? And you want to know why your churches are falling and billions of dollars in assets are being given to the devil, so to speak? I said, because Jesus is taking your lampstands. That's his promise. When you don't love me, you may be a great church like Ephesus. And Ephesus was a good church. They had good pastors. Paul had founded them. They had Timothy as a pastor. Timothy might even have still been alive at this time. We don't know. God says it's not good enough. And so even though you may think your churches are the best things, if they're failing, it's because God is coming and Jesus is sneaking into your midst and he's taking your lampstand from you. Yes, Brother Herman. Oh. Brother Nelson, a lot of times when I pray, I uh, ask the Lord to have the preeminence in our life because He needs to be first, what first in our life, right? And that's how the churches. Uh, get away from the first love they, instead of loving God right. doing the things of God they, well, let's right. try this, let's try this. yeah they, they get into programs and programs are about doing good they're good works you know our our kids quest program or when we had Awanas, our BBS those are good things okay but as people we have a tendency to focus on that stuff a lot of times and, and so an illustration I would use, Brother Herman, would be, we, 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 how many people, how many adults did we have working with BBS? A ton of adults. Now, here's my question. And I can't answer this. Only this, each individual person, if you work BBS, only you can answer this. 
How much time did you spend loving on the Lord and praying for his moving? Was it significant or was it a toss-up prayer? Okay? If you didn't spend a lot of time praying for God's protection for those kids and praying that God move in a mighty way and praying over Chuck and praying over the teachers and praying over Dorinda and doing that, guess what? You're guilty. You did good works, but you forgot the first thing. Okay? So, the counsel that they received is remember and repent. He wants you to go back to that time when you were on fire for the Lord. Remember? Remember those times? Yeah, go back there. Because that's when you were real. The reward is to eat of the tree of life. Okay, I need somebody to look up Mark um, 829. Somebody look up Mark 8, 29, and then I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that in a second as soon as somebody gets it. Uh, we eat of the tree of life. Remember, there's two trees in the Garden of Eden, am I right? Mm -hmm. There's tree of life and then the tree of what? Good and evil. Knowledge of good and evil. Okay? The tree of life is basically the key to immortality. And the key to immortality, the tree of life, is Jesus Christ. So, what he is saying here is that when you do these first things and you repent and you remember, you're going to be full of me. You're going to eat of the tree of life. And the tree of life is immortality through Jesus Christ. He says, I'll make you full. Okay? And we'll see how important that is. Especially, remember I said that each message can be used across the churches. We, we'll see how important that is when we look at the church of Laodicea. Because they're gorging on something else that's not the tree of life. And they think they're full, but they're not. And that's what many of our lives are. We think they're, it's full of stuff. And it's happiness and whatever. But actually, we're starving to death. Okay. Uh, he has an ear. Hear what the Spirit says to churches. Who's got Mark eight twenty nine? I do. Okay, Linda. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Okay. Who do you say that I am? Now, what was Peter's response? Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then what did Jesus say to Peter? Blessed are you, Simon Barjona. Be because who, who revealed this to you? Who do you say that I am? But who revealed the answer to, to the Holy Spirit? He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So, here's the key to each letter. Can you understand or actually hear apart from the Spirit? No. no. Apart from the Spirit of God working in your life in a mighty way, you cannot understand what's being said here. It's all mumbo-jumbo. Remember, the whole scripture is mumbo-jumbo unless you've got the Spirit of God living within you. That's the reason why I always get a kick out of Facebook when I've got people who I know aren't Christians lecturing me on what the Bible says. Yeah. I'm like, really? And I even told a buddy of mine last week, I said, well, that's, y'all, some of you might have seen it. Well, that's rich. I've got an atheist telling me what, uh, telling me about who God is. Excellent. That's a new one. Okay. Apart from the spirit dwelling within us, we can't understand. Yeah, exactly. Here's some miscellaneous. I always have found this part fascinating. In verse six. You, this you have. This is good. Jesus goes back to a commendation. This is the only time that he does this. He says, good, good boys, y'all are doing great. Uh, got this problem. But let me tell you about another thing you're doing good. He says, you hate the work of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Wow, that's awful strong words to come from a loving, peaceful, gentle Jesus who's got a lamb on his lap and has got kids around him, right? Mm -hmm. I hate it. Now, this is a verse that has caused much consternation on who were the Nicolaitans. Who were they? Well, believe it or not, we're not real sure. But here's what we can figure out. The word comes from two Greek words. Nikeo, which means to conquer, to overcome, to rule, and then less, the people, the laity. Laodicea... There's that word, Leo. Okay? And we'll talk about, I don't want to get ahead of myself. We'll talk about what that means. 
But here, what we see that Jesus hates is, I think it, if we read that literally, it means uh, to overcome the people. Now, who was Nicholas? Nicolaitan. We think, this, like I said, this is theory. Remember one of the seven in Acts 6 that are chosen to be deacons? They, we got Stephen, and we got a couple of others. We got six others. One of them was Nicholas. Okay? He was one of the seven chosen to have oversight of the daily administration of the church. And that, that broke off there to the poor of the church in Acts 6 5. All right? He was called, a, and that shouldn't have, I should have done a better job of editing there. He was called a proselyte of Antioch. In other words, of the seven original deacons, six were Jews. He was a Gentile. The theory is that Nicholas formed a sect called the Nicolaitans. And what he did was he was the first to start this whole separation between clergy and laity. Okay, that's the theory. If you read your Bible, you read that we do have leaders. Okay, Hebrews 13, 17 says, Obey those who have ruled over you. But we also read that we are all brothers and sisters. We also read that we are all part of the priesthood. Am I right? You are a kingdom of priests. And we understand in the context of the Old Testament exactly what that means. We are all Levites. We all have the priesthood. Okay? It is not given to special people. It's given to you by the Holy Spirit when you say, I do, to Jesus. Okay? Well, this guy was the very first one to say, no, we're a little better than you. And now we see, we see what happens over the period of the history of the church where more and more and more authority were given to the clergy, to the priesthood, to the point of all they had to do was say, you're going to hell. And that was it. Where they said, you know what? The Bible is in Latin and we are not going to, you are not allowed to have a copy of it and you're not allowed to know. Jesus says about that, when people rule over people, okay, not out of love as a shepherd, but when they rule my way or the highway, he hates it. Now, an interesting little section here. Somebody look up 3 John. Uh, turn to the book of 3 John. 3 John, uh, and it'll be uh, like verse 8 or 9. Um, let's see. Verse 9. Somebody read that for me. I wrote something to the church, but... Diotrephes. Thank you. Diotrephes, who loves to be first among them, does not accept what we say. Yeah. And then it says in verse 10, So if I come, I will bring up what he's doing. Talking wicked nonsense about us. Or against us. This was another one of these guys. Who, Diotrephes was a pastor. But he was a my way or the highway pastor. You have to listen to what I say. He did not accept any kind of authority outside of his pastoral authority. He didn't understand that there's a separation. And we see in Ephesians 4, there's a separation. We have apostles. Then we have prophets. Then we have evangelists. Then we have pastors. And then we have teachers. That is God's hierarchy. That's not my hierarchy. That's God's hierarchy. Well, what Diotrephes thought was, because I'm a pastor, I don't have to listen to you, John, as an apostle. I, I'm not going to pay attention to what... And you know what? We have, unfortunately, I've run into a lot of that in ministry. People won't accept outside help. They have somebody come in, and it, whether it's me or somebody else that, that knows how to fix these things. We're a local church, autonomy of the local church. I'm the head of it, and I'm not listening to anything you said. Hey, that's fine. All I'm going to give you is the same advice Jesus gave in Revelation 2. And I'm going to tell you, if you don't follow that advice, he'll take your candlestick. Okay? So, Nelson, yes, sir. Just to add, there's, a, there's a one sentence uh, explanation in the notes on the Bible that I think sums up that term uh, in a real simple way. Nicolaitans were believers who compromised their faith in order to enjoy some sinful practices of the Ephesian society. Mm -hmm. so. 
Yeah. Yeah. And that's one of the that's one of the theories. Uh, that you know they they were compromisers. They really were. Um, they, and they, they used their liberty falsely. Okay. Uh, prophetic fulfillment of Ephesus. As we look, it's the apostolic church. Roughly the first 70 years or so of Christianity. So, here's the key part. Nelson just wrote, that's yeah. where the uh, apostolic church comes from today. The ones that are still here, right? Right. They call themselves. Yeah, All right. So, here's the ap application. This is the most important part of today's lesson. Evaluate your devotion life. Now, I'm going to show you something. <clears throat> And I've got to make sure my volumes are all turned up because you got to hear it. It's actually video. Let me do a, let me do a mic uh, sound check here. Okay. That might be too loud. Well, come on. that way of God's word? Does that describe who you are? Because I tell you, there's been times in my life in my Christian walk that doesn't describe me. These people are meeting in a cave because of persecution. And a missionary smuggled those Bibles in. And it looked like somebody had thrown a T-bone steak in the Amazon with piranhas. And yet, We've got a dozen, two dozen Bibles in our house, okay? Now, I've got my study Bible, but unfortunately, for many, many years, my Bible stayed in the car. Evaluate your devotion is what he's saying. They could die for that. There was one of the, one of the ones we're going to show you during the week of the Laodicean church. This woman's husband, she's a pastor, he's a pastor. He'd been in jail seven times. The last time was a three year or some three year stint in a hard labor camp because of that Bible. And yet we take it for granted. When was the last time you grabbed God's word and wept over it? These are you know, it's like <laughs> it's it's what I think it was, who was it? Was it Peter that said, you know, where are we going to go? You have the words of life. Where are we, where are we going to go? So, that's the whole lesson in the church, that those few verses, is evaluate your devotional life. Evaluate if you're truly in love with the Spirit. <laughs> You know, do you enjoy spending time with him? Do you enjoy worshiping? Do you enjoy getting into God's word and just finding the mysteries there and letting God speak to you? And if that's not you, Jesus' words are repent. Because see, that's what Jesus is talking about. When you're talking about your first love, he wants to see you like that. Okay, so let's talk about it. Somebody, somebody tell me what you're thinking. Silence. <laughs> That's a powerful video. It really hits me. What makes I'd be, you feel ashamed? Because yes. You know, I, I mean, I know that I'm not that devoted to Sephiroth. 
cry or love of, oh my God, oh my gosh, I just, um, and so many people, like you say, are persecuted. Mm -hmm. I mean, and that's going to come for us too. It is it's coming. Come. It's close. Mm -hmm. But those people are willing to die. Am I willing to die for that? Yeah, they're willing to die not just for the words, but for the book. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. About this year, we, we, a lot of us spend so much time in our neighborhood driving and traveling. Um, they don't have that to the word on three days. Right. And I'm just going to uh, share with you that the heck you get this Bible recorded. You take it with you when you drive it. And you spend a lot of time in the work. What does this be most of the And for anybody who needs it, for anybody who needs it, I have it. Uh -huh. The one you put on my phone? Yes. Yeah. Uh, right here. Mm -hmm. So if you got a, if you got an iPhone and how you add music, mm -hmm. all you got to do is add that folder right there. And there's different ones, like the Blue Letter Bible, you can actually have it read to yeah. you, but it's real theatrical. I am a man who has seen affliction under the rod of his wrath. I like that one better, because the theatrical one, the voices change, and there's yeah. music in the background, and I'm like, uh-uh, I just want to be able to read, you know, listen or read and follow along, follow along, and that's, that's how I, that first week, how I did Revelation. I sat there and just hit Revelation on here, and then followed on my Bible right. as it read. Yeah. And it, was, it, was and it really does... As I've told some of you, a little bit yeah, as I've told some of you, what happens is when you read the Bible and you listen to it at the same time, you are shutting out another avenue that the enemy can distract you. Yeah. Okay? Because I don't know about you, but I get distracted real easy. If I'm just sitting there reading and quiet, I hear a bird chirp, I've got a dog barking, I've got a kid slapping another kid, you know, <laughs> and I get distracted. But if I've got my headphones on and I've got my Bible blaring, my mind wanders. I, my mind wanders yeah, too. And it just shuts off another avenue. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like what Brother Bob Lockhart shared with us too. If you can speak it as, as well, you can listen, see it, and speak it. You have now shut the enemy totally out. Mm -hmm. you, you're going to really have a... You've got to be really talented to let your mind wander during that time. 